so welcome to, to everybody that's uh, attending the seminar and also this session in particular. Uh, my name is Troy Smythe, and if you were at last session, you saw me again. I'm, I have a little different role in this one. Um, but for those of you who, who didn't get to, meet, get to meet me, I'm manager of interpretive strategy uh, for the Corning Museum of Glass. Uh, with me are our moderator, Grant Jonathan, who I'll introduce in a bit, and three artists, Mary Jacobs, Samantha Jacobs, and Hayden Haynes, who he will introduce in just a bit. Uh, first, I'd like to say that I'm speaking to you from the museum, which as our director, Carol White mentioned earlier, uh, is sited on the territory of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. This region is still home to the Haudenosaunee people and many of them are artists. I am fortunate to have the opportunity to live, work and share ideas here. And I'm especially grateful for the relationships represented by the people on this panel. As artists and researchers, they generously share with many people the wisdom that comes from their hands, their mouths and the good mind. This panel grew out of a vignette in the exhibition, Past, Present, Expanding the Stories of Glass, uh, which is currently on view at the museum and is uh, one of the reasons we're having the seminar that we are. Uh, and if you could pull up the slide deck for us, uh, I wanted to show a couple. Of so if you could give me the next slide. There we go. Um, so the vignette featured um, that this uh, beaded object, which is a match safe, uh, Alexandra Ruggiero, who was then the curator of Modern Glass here at the museum, uh, was interested in expanding the stories associated with the match safe beyond its function and where it was purchased, which was in Chautauqua in Western New York. Um, the original maker's voice, uh, voices are lost to us at present, but fortunately, Haudenosaunee beadwork is an art form that is alive and well, and many Haudenosaunee beadworkers also conduct research as part of their practice. Uh, Mary Jacobs and Samantha Jacobs, who are with us today, agreed to sit down with the match safe and in a very short amount of time, we're able to fill in uh, some of the blanks regarding where it was likely made, uh, which is, uh, we think, most likely uh, Mohawk uh, to the east of Chautauqua, uh, possibly Chautauqua, uh, still kind of formalizing all of that. Um, and, there's, and they also were able to let us know more about who made it and the fact that it was probably not made by just one person uh, and also that the skills that were mastered to make it as well as information. Uh, that perspective of makers was so valuable, we decided we needed to hear more from more makers, uh, not just about the objects, but also uh, their thoughts on displaying Haudenosaunee beadwork. Uh, I'm very grateful uh, to Grant Jonathan, who agreed to be our moderator for this conversation. Uh, Grant is enrolled uh, an enrolled member of the Tuscarora Nation, one of the six nations of the Haudenosaunee people, also known as the people of the Longhouse or Iroquois Confederacy. He is of the Bear Clan. Grant can currently serves as the tribal program manager for the U.S. EPA Region 2 Indian Nations Program, where he coordinates matters for eight Indian nations, serves as the program consultation advisor, and manages all environmental general assistance programs grants. Grant received his BA from the State University of New York at Buffalo, his Juris Doctorate from the University of Buffalo, and a Master of Studies in Environmental Law from Vermont Law School. He is an active member of the New York State Bar, and outside of the EPA, uh, Grant consults on historical Tuscarora raised beadwork history and repatriates antique Iroquois beadwork uh, to his and other Haudenosaunee communities. He also uh, operates a beading supply business um, that serves New York, as well as parts of Canada. Um, and I actually have a couple of examples of Grant's work. Can you give me the next slide, please? He is also an artist and a man. Oh boy. Next slide. There we go. Thank you. Um, and so you can see some of uh, kind of
I think he froze up. <laughs> Uh, well, you know what, folks, why don't we get started? Because I believe he froze up here. Um, okay, so I'm going to first extend a thank you, a, a Nyawa in our language to Courting Glass for inviting us to participate in this panel today. We understand that um, the theme for this year is expanding the stories of glass, which also celebrates the United Nations International Year of Glass, and that this special exhibit uh, at the Corning Museum of Glass is called Past, Present, Expanding the Stories of Glass and highlights the essential role of glass in historical and contemporary contexts. Uh, this is very relevant and important to our three panelists, as you will hear, and um, I'm going to introduce all of them today as they speak a little bit about the cultural, economic, and historical significance of glass beads and their use in Haudenosaunee beadwork. Um, so with that, I'm going to start by uh, providing Mary Jacobs Spiel here. Uh, Mary Jacobs is from the Seneca Nation in Western New York. She is Turtle Clan and comes from the Cattaraugus Territory. Her bio is inspired by her surrounding environment in upstate New York and her own cultural history. Mary creates traditional Iroquois raised beadwork. Through research of antique creations, her work includes traditional patterns and designs. While using elements such as artisan glass, semi-precious and precious stones, stone beads and floral designs, textiles and leather, all of Mary's pieces tell a story. The most enjoyable of her pieces to make is the pincushion beaded bird. I have to agree with her. I like making birds as well. Once a traded tourist item along the Niagara Falls region, Mary has given a modern design aesthetic with bright colors and quality materials. With her knowledge and experience, Mary also shares her teachings to members of her community through lectures, displays, and classes. While inspiring others in the art of beadwork, Mary hopes to revive and continue cultural traditions. Um, I don't know if folks can see the PowerPoint, but if you could forward it to show Mary's work. Um, she has some beautiful pieces there. Our next panelist is Samantha Jacobs. Samantha Jacobs is a Seneca artist from the Seneca Nation, and she also resides at the Cattaraugus Territory. Samantha is a member of the Native Roots Artist Guild. She originally learned beadwork from her mother, who is Mary Jacobs, and has sought out other master artists in her chosen areas of interest. Samantha has expanded her repertoire to include quill work, moose, and car caribou hair tufting. Samantha works on her home territory as a full-time artist, while also sharing her knowledge as a community educator. And if you could forward the PowerPoint to show Samantha's work as well. Uh, she has a couple of beautiful pieces there. And then our last speaker is a gentleman also from the Seneca Nation. His name is Hayden Haynes and he is Deer Clan. Hayden grew up on the Seneca Cattaraugus territory in Western New York. When he was about 10, his aunt gave him a Dremel power tool for his birthday. She explained that he could make things with it he never used it because he didn't know how and he didn't know what to make, but he kept that Dremel with him as he used it. Uh, and uh, he grew up into his early 20s. Uh, he, he would frequent the Seneca Iroquois National Museum in Salamanca, New York, and he would go there to look at the carvings by Stan Hill Sr., uh, Norman Jimerson, and Wayne Skye. Um, that is when his interest in carving began. At that time, Hayden was really into hunting and he had a lot of antlers lying around. So one day he pulled out the Dremel and began experimenting with antler carving. At first he was carving simple eagle heads and other things derived from Seneca stories. That was about 15 years ago. After he felt comfortable with the Dremel tool, he began carving with a Fordham. Hayden currently works at the Seneca Iroquois National Museum in Salamanca, New York. Working there impacts his viewpoint on how his culture is represented 
and reaffirms his commitment to keeping this tradition alive. His work is about healing from the past, but also an expression of Haudenosaunee life today. He expands a traditional medium through techniques and aesthetics in the hopes of inspiring others to take up this dying art. His other goal is to educate people on the historical and cultural significance of not only antler carving uh, the art, but on the material itself. He thinks it's a medium that doesn't get enough attention, although the significance of it predate that of more common art forms and material. So those are our three panelists for today. And we're gonna present each of them with some questions. I think we're gonna start with Mary. Mary, I'm gonna ask you uh, the first question. What is important to you when it comes to how historic beadwork is presented? Mary, we can't hear you. While she's figuring that out, Sam, why don't we go to you? I'll, I'll ask you the same question. <laughs> what is important to you when it comes to how historic beadwork is presented? I think one of the main things that um, any institution or any organization who has historical beadwork really needs to think about is how the history of the piece is presented to the public. Um, whether it comes from a people that are still living and people who are continuing to carry on the tradition of whatever the piece is within their own communities, that really needs to be conveyed to the public. So it's not something that's just was made 100 years ago or 500 years ago. If those people are still living, then they should also have uh, an idea of where to contact them to maybe learn more from the people themselves. Consultation with the, the makers of these art, art, art forms is very, very important. And I, I would agree with that. Um, Mary, shall we try this again? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can, okay. perfect. <laughs> yes. So one of the things that I was trying to mention was that it's important to understand where the um, makers come from. A lot of our people, uh, don't get me wrong, we come from the Six Nations, but a lot of our people don't necessarily only have one nation living in their territory. We'll take our area, Cataraugus, for example. So we have Cugas, we have Tuscaroras, besides the Senecas living here. So sometimes, even though it says that the maker is from a uh, specific area, that might not be the nation that they're from. So I think that aspect is important to find out where the maker comes from and what nation they are whenever we're looking up or trying to find the history on a piece that was made. Thank you, Mary. That Katie. kind of gives any one of the nations credit for the creations that they made, because I really think a lot of them blended together. They did. They most certainly did. Hayden, did you have any thoughts? I mean, you work at the museum down there in Salamanca. What did you think about this and how historic work is presented? Anything you wanted to add? Sure, yeah, sir. Similar to um, what Mary said, you know, I definitely want to um, echo what both of Mary and uh, Sam said, but, you know, these, I think it's important to also note that, you know, um, these are not objects, right, in the sense that a museum typically thinks about them. These are, to me, um, examples of resiliency, because these are items that are created in the specific time frames. Take, for instance, the, uh, you know, the, the, tourist trade uh, items from Niagara Falls and Montreal areas. They are, you know, beautiful pieces, of course, but there's a story that goes with it. You know, these people weren't um, creating these items necessarily everybody just to show. These are, uh, I, our people have constantly been on our heels due to the shared history with the United States. And so oftentimes, and to this day, people that make that work do it as a necessity, as a way to supplement income, or it is their only income. So there's a whole story that goes along with these beautiful pieces that sometimes, well, I have, I haven't heard it, I haven't seen it in a museum setting actually take place, like the, that conversation of, of what happened and how did we get to that point and the backstory as to why a lot of those makers were 
putting out so much of that work. Thank you, Hayden. If I could just add one thought to this, and it was something that Samantha touched on, I think it's very important when any historical artwork is being exhibited in a museum that you speak to the descendants of the people uh, that the artwork is attributed to. In other words, if something is identified as Seneca, before it goes on display, you should speak to the Seneca Nation, people in their museums, people in their leadership, and, and get their input and their thoughts on it. Same would be true if something was identified as Mohawk or Tuscarora or one of the other uh, Six Nations, but that's very important, as Samantha had uh, pointed out. Uh, Mary, I wanted to go back to you for a minute and was wondering if you could um, share a little bit of how you would describe your relationship to traditional Haudenosaunee beadwork, the historical stuff in particular. I think how I would describe it as being an inspiration to me. Um, we'll take, for example, I like to make purses. That's one of the things I like to make. So in our research and looking at old pieces, I will find a particular shape that I like, and I will use that same shape, but I will put a more contemporary twist on it. I may right. use the traditional rope pattern, which you find around a lot of old pieces, which is um, something that we love to teach because that something that you see quite often in old pieces or even a straight line for that matter. But those old designs and techniques, I like to try to use more a contemporary thing that they would use, um, not necessarily a older purse because a lot of the purses around the Niagara Falls area that were for trade were very small. They were mm -hmm. very small pieces. And that's because um, back then the women didn't carry any money or, you know, and they, they carry just little because they weren't, the men didn't allow them to, you know, but yeah. now, you know, they, they want to carry all kinds of stuff. I mean, my kids laugh at me because I have the grandma bag and I have everything impossible in there, you know, or the backpack for that yeah. matter. But you can put beads on all those things. That purse that might have started out as a small item that we beaded on now has become a contemporary thing, like a backpack that we use and embellish with the beads. No. Yeah. So you've adapted, you know, over time and, you know, the change and are, are doing things that will um, attract people of today and things that they can use and utilize and stuff. That's that's what I think a lot of our uh, Haudenosaunee artists are doing. Samantha, any thoughts from you on this? Uh, how would you describe your relationship to the traditional historic beadwork? I think um, just to kind of pay back off what my mom said, we like to go in and uh, look at the collections and then be able to look at those patterns and those pieces that were used. We look at the stitches, we see how they were actually constructed and then we take those old patterns and then we'll bring them back to our local uh, beading group that meets weekly and we will bring those patterns back and revitalize them. We might not necessarily do the exact pattern, um, but we use the construction to be able to create contemporary designs. So like one of the things that I personally like to always look at is how um, makers did birds like way back then. I've taken pictures of like exhumed in as close as I can on old pictures of birds on different pieces. And then in our room that we meet for our weekly bead group, I have all those printed out. So all the different um, women who come to our bead group can see them. And then I'm able to show them, okay, this is one style of bird that, you know, was on a pin cushion. The same style was also on a, you know, a pair of moccasins or something. But then to show them that like, those patterns weren't necessarily just on one thing. You can use them multiple different ways. And then you can use different color styles or different kinds of beads or different styles of beads to make yours that you're going to make from that original pattern your own. So it's not just making the same thing over and over again. Yeah. So being, um, I guess, taking inspiration from the historical pieces is really the big thing. I have done the same as a bead worker. I'd like to look at the old and patterns that were utilized in our community at the Tuscarora Nation, and you don't see them anymore. It's nice to revive them and share them with people and get them uh, used again. You know, um, one pattern that I like to make are owls. And, uh, you know, we, we had uh, many families that made beaded owls on certain items. So I, I've taken a look at a lot of these pieces and I've 
change the pattern a little bit and I use it in my beadwork and uh, really enjoy that. It does provide inspiration. Hayden, did you have any thoughts about this with regard to your relationship with um, traditional Haudenosaunee beadwork? Um, yeah, in a general sense for when it comes to uh, uh, materials that our people have made when it comes to showing them historical items, right? I feel like um, they should also be um, paired up with contemporary makers, right? Because uh, there's a that narrative, right? That people uh, keep us in the past in a sense, right? And so mm -hmm. it's an opportunity, right? These, I feel like all these exhibitions are, are more just aesthetic. And I know there's a lot of substance to them, but uh, these are opportunities for other conversations that haven't been had, right? But we need people, like you had said, to talk to our communities that have these open minds that have the, that have the desire to start some of these conversations. So pairing up, you know, say a quilled pouch from the 1700s, right? Pairing that, um, you know, talking about that piece, of course, and a little bit about the history, but also pairing it with uh, a contemporary maker or makers and get their perspectives as part of the display. And it's also a way to show, show people that, hey, these are pieces that were made by living descendants of us, but also our people are still making these as opposed to, you know, because I guess I'm coming from it from a perspective of working at the museum, especially because uh, we get so many people here um, through there that don't have much knowledge at all other than what they were taught in schools or, or what we just weren't taught at all. And so oftentimes people don't even think people are still making things like this. They don't sometimes don't even think that Indians are even still alive. Yeah. And it's really, you know, it's, it's a real thing. And it's, it seems stark to think that in this modern age of technology and, and uh, information that's at everybody's disposal, but there's a lot of people that don't have it. So it's an opportunity, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it's nice to show that these uh, cultural traditions that we have in our communities are still alive. And we're still doing them today, you know, bead, doing beadwork. So let's shift to uh, a discussion about contemporary work for a minute here. Uh, Mary, let's come back to you. What is important to you as a maker when it comes to your work or other contemporary work being exhibited in a museum? Mm, I gotta think on it for a minute. Okay. What's important? Well, um, let's, let's, let's say hypothetically, let's say you made a couple of birds and they were going into an exhibit in a museum. What do you, as the maker of those, what would you, what's your expectation on how they're presented to the public or how they're installed in the museum? What do you think should be done with them? Oh, okay. So I guess if I had my birds on display, I would want to, I think what Hayden had mentioned about seeing the birds that were made previously, you know, maybe some of the older pieces, older birds that were made compared to the contemporary ones I would be making. When the birds originally started, they were quite small. They were just little things like, like these. I don't know if you can see how small it is. They were just little, but now we've, um, increase the size. Lots of times people will get them mainly for, um, for on their Christmas tree. That's the things that they get most. So I would like it for displayed so that they can see how the birds started, the smaller ones that were older pieces to the contemporary ones that we have now. And maybe a couple pictures of somebody actually using the bird as a pin cushion, like putting pins in there and somebody else for the contemporary one actually putting it on a Christmas tree. And when you do that, I'd also like to personally have maybe a, a different panel showing the construction, all the way starting from the design, figuring out the, uh, the actual pattern to make the bird, the construction, uh, put the bird, bird together, putting on the beads, and the last photo, obviously, of it hanging on the tree. I think that's important so that people understand that um, a lot of the things that we make come from creations that were, you know, thought of, I, I didn't invent the wheel. I'm just reinventing it. Right, right. <laughs> right. Thank you, Mary. Hey, can, uh, I start? can I just interrupt for just a second? Sure. I got, the entire museum's internet got shut down. And so I got kicked off, which means I think your slide presentation must have gotten kicked off too. Um, if I don't know where you were, but do you want me to bring up 
bring it back up or you want to bring it up later or um i think we're good for now we were talking like as i introduce each one if somebody could bring up the slides you know let's, yeah let's just keep going and maybe at the end we could you know show yeah. some of the pictures again when you close actually absolutely i think people okay. would appreciate that go ahead um so samantha with regard to your you know contemporary beadwork what is important to you as a maker when it comes to your work being uh, exhibited? I think um, I would also like to mention that like a lot of my pieces tell a story and maybe having um, the opportunity to show what inspired the pieces. So oftentimes <clears throat> um, I also do like a monthly newsletter with the Seneca language department. So I'm always focusing on like different traditional stories and how they play into the designs and motifs that we use within our contemporary beadwork. So I bring a lot of those same designs to my pieces. And then I'd like the opportunity to be able to share like, oh, this is you know the design I use because it comes back to this story. Or I use this piece because I was inspired by, you know, the birds that I seen on my travel. You know, oftentimes the work that I do, there's a story attached to it. And then having the opportunity to share that with everybody who sees it, not just um, the construction, but also, you know, why I made it, you know, why should I bring that to the public? Why was it something that I felt needed to be shared? You know, having that opportunity to do so is important as an artist, not only as you know, for what I do, but also sharing those cultural traditions with everybody and use it as a platform to educate. You had a piece that you made following a, a trip to the South Pacific. Maybe you could say a few words about that and describe what was on it and because this demonstrates what we're talking about. Okay, so um, we, our bead group decided to do a five-sided urn and on each one of those sides everybody had kind of agreed to do you know their own design and mostly everybody did flowers but at the time I had gone to a volunteer vacation to Tahiti and um, Moria so I did like coral planting I did beach cleanups and I swam with whales and sharks and all this you know super fun stuff and when I got back the group had started to do the urn and everybody was making the designs for all their pieces. And I wanted to be able to, again, tell another story of you know, who I am as an artist. And that was the perfect platform to be able to you know, do <clears throat> each side of the urn, a different sea creature. And then on the bottom, I tufted using uh, moose hair and caribou tufting, uh, the different corals that I helped plant when I went on my trip. So even though it was a traditional, I guess, pattern, of a five-sided urn, I made it contemporary and I made it my own by being able to tell my own story and creating different pieces within raised beadwork and then tufting. Do you think artists should have an advisory role uh, to curators at museums and those that are developing the exhibits, you know, and have a say in how their work is exhibited? Yeah, I think it would be great. I think like, whatever museum is in, you know, wherever they are, they should also tap into the local communities that they're serving and mm -hmm. have an advisory panel from, you know, that consists of not only makers and experts within the field, but, you know, being able to have that conversation with people to, you know, be able to lend their voice to the exhibits. That's always important. Yep. Representation matters. Let's go back to your mother for a minute. Mary, would you agree with that as well? Oh, yes, I agree. I oh. think that I, it might give them an idea to, uh, again, the story of the piece that's there, because a, a lot of pieces, um, a lot of families made the beadwork, like my family, for instance, all three of my daughters do beadwork, you know, my, I learned from my grandmother who got us started at a, started as a young age. And those families may have descendants that from whoever created that piece and maybe they got a little more history on it all you got to do is go and ask them and you can find that information out yep let's uh go to you hayden for a minute um you work at the museum there iroquois seneca museum in salmanca um this question, Troy, I'm going to tweak it just a little. 
it was uh, with regard to um, a sense of inclusion, but uh, Hayden, what to create a sense of inclusion in the display of beadwork? I mean, what, what should be included if, if uh, the museum was going to work on a major beadwork exhibit? What do you think should be done with this? What should be included? Well, <clears throat> I hope, you know, the, the people have been paying attention to, to what uh, Mary and, and, and uh, Sam and uh, Grant have been saying, because those are all perfect. And yeah, reaching out to the communities, like I, we work at the Seneca Iroquois, right? So Seneca is particularly what we focus on. And then, you know, the rest of the Haudenosaunee nations. But if you follow, you know, what we do and what we display, um, it's an emphasis on Seneca because it's a, it's out of respect, right? And if we, we have to respect the other nations and what we uh, display and how we display it. So it's important to, as has already been said, consult with those nations, those peoples from those nations and the families of those makers so that we are, you know, just being respectful. And, a lot, and you know, we kind of live in a world and it, we've kind of alluded to it throughout this conversation about like, um, decolonization and, and uh, uh, the effects of settler colonialism like this is a huge topic um, nowadays land acknowledgments so that those are super popular right now right but what we're all talking about on this panel today is like action items right these are like things that like we can actually that museums can actually do right as opposed to just a land acknowledgement which, which is great but there's work that has to be done a conversation that can center around some of this beadwork stuff and this is certainly something that the museum would um, consider putting in there is to talk about the disruption uh, that trade, the intro introduction of new materials in general had on our arts and crafts, you know, from pottery to quill work to antler carving, you know, the list goes on, right? And then of course, the, the ever growing uh, hunger for uh, independence and land, right, and the effects that that had on our on our uh, ability to retain some of that stuff that our people were making, and also carry some of those things on, and it's, it's just a disruption, right? But that's part of this conversation. So instead of basically, you know, to to kind of use uh, part of the uh, colonialism uh, mindset, instead of just taking what we do as an in in extracting our information, extracting these images of our uh, ancestors work for these uh, exhibitions be more respectful and speak to actually sort of what was happening at that time and how we got to those points and what we are doing today and how we are behind right because of those actions um we are behind and that's why it's so important for people like mary sam and grant that are doing stuff like this taking time out of their days and, and teaching people and speaking to you folks because we're behind right and why are we behind? This has to be a part of the conversation, in my opinion, for all of that, especially people, right? So, you know, that's that's all I really wanted to say on that subject. Thanks, Hayden. What do you think, Sam? What to create a sense of inclusion and display of beadwork? Um, I guess just reiterating what I said, you know, being, uh, having the opportunity to talk to the communities that the beadwork is representing, uh, making sure that the stories that are being told through the displays are positive in a way that the community they're represented is agreeing with. So like, you know, it's nice to be able to show those historic pieces, but um, it needs to be in context and you need to have the community that it's representing, uh, their voice needs to be included. Mm -hmm. Mary, closing thoughts on this question? <laughs> I think they've both said it very well already. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Again, making sure that the people, wherever the beadwork came from, we hear from them too. Get their input. Because like I said, a lot of beadwork, if not all of it, has some kind of story or meaning. I mean, when we do a lot of pieces, our, our stories are in there, like our creation story, when we're creating the sky domes, our three leaves in there, or three three flowers could be like our three sisters, you know, for me, lots of times I put the number three in there because it represents my three daughters. And then like when I make flowers, I have three flowers and two little buds for my grandkids. So everything has some kind of meaning to the creator of that piece. 
So I think when you go and um, do any kind of uh, display or exhibit, find out from that maker what they would like to see. And that could be on one, like I said, one of those panels about the piece. What, what's the story behind it? Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> I wanna go back to Hayden for a minute because I'm wearing one of his pieces and uh, wanted to ask him some questions. But our, our, this question that was provided by Troy is, um, what do you wish museums to understand about your artwork and how would you like to see the display of it either traditionally or contemporarily? But you know what, as I read this, we've already kind of answered this. So um, we've been talking a lot about beadwork and our use of glass because all our beads are glass or stone. But I'd like to shift for a minute and talk about some of the work that Hayden has done with antler carving and so forth. And um, I'll show folks this, uh, this piece of his that I got. This is a uh, Iroquois pottery. You can see on there that there are um, corn husk stalls all the way around, but the necklace itself is glass. It's all glass beads. And um, Hayden, why don't you talk a little bit about this? Yeah, thanks, Matt. You know, it's um, materials are important, right? And the subject matter of, for that particular one um, has to do with pottery. And so as it relates to what I do in terms of like historical uses um, with bone and antler tools, implements, um, oftentimes, and even still to this day, some makers prefer to use um, uh, to incise their pots and stuff or to do general shaping of the uh, pieces with um, stone, or I'm sorry, antler and bone uh, tools, you know? So um, like all things in our cosmology, in our culture, everything is interconnected. So whenever things are like that is made, you know, I have those corn husk doll figurines on there. That's one of our traditional arts, right? We have pottery, that's, you know, something that's part of our traditional arts. And then we get including the glass beads um, as part of our, these are all like an intertwining of of material culture and um, and honoring of all those things at, while at the same time providing an aesthetic that can hopefully capture the uh, attention of other people to start acknowledging these other art forms such as like, you know, the moose hair that, you know, uh, uh, tufting that Sam does and in, in the uh, antler carving and these other mediums that don't uh, get the same uh, acknowledgement in terms of the role that they played in our uh, timeline of uh, history because they're again interconnected you know I'll give you one example when we look at Seneca decorative bone combs for example um, even ones that are like uh, pre-contact there's a lot of engravings on those a lot of those engravings are zigzag or cross hatching or they look like diamond patterns um, hourglass uh, motifs and um, there's a lot of uh, symbols symbolism between, uh, behind that uh, those images, those symbols and those uh, motifs, I should say. What's interesting that, again, these are just softballs, in my opinion, for people that even had a chance to want to listen to what we're talking about today. One thing that you could discuss is how those cross-hatching designs, those hourglasses, those diamond shapes, um, when you look at when the Seneca decorative bone comb era ended around, you know, the height of it, I should say, in like the 1750s, and then the emergence of this flat Seneca beadwork in the early 1800s. And there's a lot of similarities if you really look at it, but nobody really talks about that. The mm -hmm. edging, not the edging, but the borders of a lot of those flat purses and the Seneca beadwork, there's a lot of geometric designs, which is what's found on a lot of those old Seneca bone combs. There's certainly a lot of diamond shapes in those designs. There's certainly a lot of hourglass shapes. And these are things that is never really part of the conversation. And that's because of the things we're talking about because our communities are involved in these conversations when displaying this stuff. So that's how we get segmented into these different separate categories or pigeonholed into these boxes where beadwork is beadwork. It's not connected to anything else. Antler is antler. It's not connected to nothing else. They're not connected to stories. They're not connected to our history. They're not connected to our ceremonies. They're not connected to nothing. They're just objects and the people that made them most times don't even get discussed. So we don't even 
pay respect to the ancestors that even made these pieces and and in and it's somewhat inhumanizing these people right so when you look at that flat b work going back to that again there's a conversation to be had there and i've seen a lot of and i'm sure grant has seen more than i've ever even seen in general uh designs of uh these dual mirrored images on these purses right mm -hmm. those mirrored images on the seneca purses and in the um, souvenir beaded stuff there's always like a dual image a mirrored image a lot of oftentimes not always um that's very common on those old bone combs but the disruption as i said the the machine of the of the united states and and their buildup and the disruption of our uh, material culture um, played a part in when that bone comb era sort of ended and then this emergence of these new materials these beautiful glass pieces that our ancestors made came about but there's a conversation in there about basically what i just said so that's the only thing i really wanted to mention about that sam did you want to mention anything about uh your usage of glass in your work um so but it's not just seed beads you use you use some no, glass no, beads no. And they're, they're beautiful so, thank you um we do well i don't want to say we but like my group and my mom and like the beaters in Cataraugus, we have transitioned to using not just glass but also semi-precious stones mm -hmm. and uh we also use hayden's beads that he makes out of his antler um yeah. pieces so those are really nice too. Um, but we also make sure that whatever pieces we're using, that if it's appropriately for the weight of the piece, because you don't want something that's too heavy, that's not gonna, uh, that's gonna disrupt the functionality of the piece that we're working on. So we always look at the color choices. Um, we like to use shell often. Like I use a lot of abalone, a lot of mother of pearl, a lot of those things in, um, I guess my pieces also. But one of the things that to guess kind of, talk about like what Hayden was talking about, that transition from our more natural materials to the glass, you know, during like the 1800s to like mid 1800s, that transition period from using moose hair and porcupine quills to beads is one that I've been researching within the past probably like two, three years. And I've contacted a couple of museums to be able to go look at their collections to be able to see, you know, some of those old designs. And when we uh, transitioned from making those flat bags and having that moose hair in there to just strictly beads, you know, and then being able to bring that history back to our own community is important so that we as people understand, okay, this is our history. This is now why we use, you know, beads versus porcupine quills or moose hair and understand that we have the opportunity and the responsibility as culture bearers to be able to, and artists, to be able to share that knowledge with our own community. And part of I guess being good um, artists within our community is being make sure that we do that and then sharing that knowledge so then everyone else can then share it with the people that they know so it goes throughout the community and then they can share it with people outside the community whether that means museums or galleries or whatever you know it's up to us to be able to make sure that we share the knowledge it's, and take it upon ourselves to you know gain the knowledge first i 100 percent agree with you um, I can't wait to hear this presentation. Uh, oh. <laughs> I got kicked off the internet here at the museum again. So now I'm in our, our operations booth. For, I can, um, so we are recording this, thankfully. So I will be able to go back and listen to all of this great information that you're giving. So, um, we're at 3.45. Our panel uh, ends at 4. Um, do we want to uh, like take the last 10 minutes to go through the slides? Because we have had some uh, guests want to see the images that the artist submitted. Sure, we could do that and possibly look at the chat as well, see if there's any important questions in there that we might be able to answer. Yeah, I checked in there. Haven't, we don't have anything right now, but uh, perhaps once we get, uh, why don't we move to, can you, uh, can, can you pull up the slides for me, the slide deck PowerPoint? Yeah, start with that one and then we can go to Mary's work. Okay, next slide. Next slide. 
And then next slide. There we go. This is, yeah. So Mary, you've got both of your pieces here that you sent. So I have two pieces there. The first one, the red uh, rectangle, which is a necklace. It actually has, um, we were talking about every piece tells a story. So this little piece is, um, if you notice at the bottom, the half moon shape, that's what we typically call our sky dome. And underneath it are the three little uh, leaves. And that's usually symbolic of like our three sisters. Um, so our, like our corns, beans, and squash. So every single piece, we try to put a little bit of our story in there. And on top of the sky dome is what we called our celestial tree. And it's nice and bright. So I made it with um, white uh, blossoms on it. On the next um, adjacent to it is a more contemporary item that we just created and it's actually a men's clip on tie. Again, what we were doing is um, actually we found this one, if I can remember correctly, it has some of like what Hayden was talking about, the little hash marks that look like pottery. And in the middle, it ever, it has the uh, fan wampum belt design. But of course, what I put in uh, most of my things are floral work the things that I see around me that I appreciate. And if I remember correctly, I think this one has the um, stones in it. It has like small quartz stones in there. So we try to use not only glass, but natural stones in our creations. I did not know that. Uh, thanks, Mary, I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Um, yeah, Troy, if I could- grant. If I could just mention one thing, in a lot of our um, beading classes in our communities, the teachers state, you can use glass, you can use stone, but do not use anything plastic or <laughs> synthetic. Yeah. Because yeah. When, you, when you go to these major native art competitions nationwide, your pieces are disqualified if they have plastic. Oh, you really? have to use glass and gems and Precious stones, no. things like yeah. that. Yeah, just wanted to say that. So yeah, Evelyn, it's so interesting that you mentioned the distinction that glass and precious stones are both kind of acceptable. You know, glass as a material has one long been valued for its ability to imitate and look like precious stones. Mm -hmm. So there, it sounds like even today they're still a partner uh, here in this part of the world as well. That's really interesting. Um, Great. Uh, do we want to move on to the next slide? Yes. Which are yes. Samantha's. Go ahead. Yeah, Samantha, you want to talk a little bit about these? Yeah, sure. So um, the slide on the gray one, that is actually a, uh, we call it a wocket, which is actually a picture frame wall pocket. And I had seen a picture of one of these in, I think on eBay or something. And then I seen an actual physical example of one um, when we went to look at the State Museum's collection. And it was really small and we looked at it and uh, we took a picture of the uh, piece. We figured out how to construct it. We brought it home and that's one of the projects that actually we did with our bead group. And again, I said um, previously that I like to look at the birds. So whenever I do birds, I make mine different by incorporating um, the actual colors of the birds I'm trying to make. So um, the gray piece is actually uh, black capped chickadees and it's on my very favorite velvet, which is that gunmetal gray velvet that I can't get anymore. Um, so that's one of the things that, you know, really depicts like what we do, being able to take those old pieces and then bring them back to our community. And then the other piece is actually a bag that I made a couple of years ago for the Santa Fe Indian Market. And I am a gardener. So I have a garden usually, and I like to do sunflowers. So that year I made uh, sunfire sunflowers. Uh, that's what I planted. And that's actually what the flowers that I depicted in the middle was that uh, sunfire sunflower, along with uh, some of the Baltimore Orioles that were hanging around in the garden that year. So that really, is distinctive of what was happening in my, you know, home life at the time. And, you know, it tells a story of what was happening when I created the piece, but yeah, it also yeah. shows the functionality of the things that we create. I mean, they're not just pieces meant to be looked at and stuffed in a cabinet somewhere. You know, they're made to be functional, like the picture frame you can actually use and hang up somewhere in the bag you can actually use because it's leather and it's made to be used and loved. 
it kind of connects to that idea, of Mary, you mentioned earlier about always, you know, there are a lot of times you'll find connections of, of your own story put into an object that you make. And that's true here too. Well, I'm, I, I, I Grant, I'm sorry. I'm not, I don't want to take over. So if you, if you want to bring out things that I'm missing, you know, as a novice, that I would love that. But I, one well, of the things I'm, I was, I was giggling when Samantha said she can't get that gunmetal velvet anymore. It's because I got it for her and we can't <laughs> find it anywhere. Uh -huh. I, yeah. I, I looked in Paris, I looked over in Europe and it's it's really difficult to find. It's What's unique about it is it's Pané silk, which means it's a silk velvet where it's pressed in one direction on a special machine. And you can't get these anywhere. I've been looking in the garment district in New York City, out in LA, and uh, when you do find it, it's not, it's not cheap. It's like fifty to ninety dollars a yard. So wow. you covet that piece and you use it for your special, special things, which she did here. <laughs> yeah, well, it looks absolutely special, and mm -hmm. I, I've always, you know, I, I wish people could be in person to see these pieces because. There, it's very textural. I mean, it's almost, I, I, I mean, one of the things that Haudenosaunee beadwork can be famous for is, is the raised beadwork, which you, which you definitely see here, but it's much easier to see in person. And it just has this such a tactile quality, which is set off by the, the velvet as well. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about the re, raised design. Is that part of kind of historical traditional work that um, well, there were three historical traditional types of beadwork, and the historical Seneca was flat beadwork. But you know, now the contemporary beadwork artists from Seneca Nation, you know, all three communities, uh, Allegheny, Cataraugus, and uh, Tonawanda, a lot of them are now doing raised beading and uh, doing it in their own style, their own patterns, and, you know, producing some really beautiful work. The, uh, the other two historical types of beadwork were the Tuscarora and the Mohawk, and we, our two nations always did raised beading. Um, there were some similarities between the two, but there were also some major differences, and um, we can trace back doing this type of beadwork going well into the mid-1800s. Wow. Or the Seneca, it was older and it went back to the early 1800s and they used different beads too. Their beads were smaller and all their beadwork was in color, but it was flat and it was right. geometrical designs, medicinal designs, um, designs of like deities and things like that. So it's beautiful stuff. But there was three distinct styles of Haudenosaunee beadwork. And now everybody does everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and I, I, which actually I think is a nice segue to Hayden's work. Can you bring up the next slide, please? This is our last slide, I think. There's uh, my necklace. <laughs> yeah, that's what you're wearing today, Grant. Is that right? Yeah, that's that's his thing. <laughs> okay. I'm actually wearing one of Samantha's pieces myself, so I'm very proud of it. Uh, Hayden, tell us uh, tell us about what you have here. Uh, before I do, I got to show something here. I'm in uh, Oklahoma, Tulsa with my family for a show, and I brought something with me right here. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah. These are these are moccasins made by Sam. And so earlier oh. she was talking, she was talking about how these things are meant to be uh, uh, seen, right? And they are, you know, definitely those are super sought after uh, moccasins that people really covet and. Um, but they, they have to be worn. I bring them out only a couple times a year to wear them. So uh, I just wanted to share that. The, that. the, the necklace that uh, Grant is wearing, is, again, yes, is on the left. And I did speak a little bit about that. But I'd like to talk about this uh, one on the right. because And I, and I su submitted this for consideration to uh, show on this uh, panel because um, I, it speaks to a lot of what we've been talking about. When you look at that figure on that decorative comb, <clears throat> It's a, it's, a, it's a figure, it's based off of a figure that was found on a Seneca site. Um, and, and, and in the original figure, I'm talking about the red there, 
uh, that figure is sort of holding up his hands. Some say he's like waving, you know, the town of peace. It sounds cool. It sounds touristy. But I don't know. I, 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 I uh, didn't like that interpretation. It's a Seneca piece from a Seneca town. And I felt like um, it might have had a different meaning, maybe, at least to me. So what I did is I just changed it and I had the hand instead of waving, as they say he is, hi. Um, I had him holding that sign. What that sign says is reclaim what's ours. And so as you can see on here, well, you probably can't see, but um, those carved beads, uh, excluding the ones at the top that are uh, glass uh, trade beads, um, these beads that are carved out of antler, and some are um, polychrome, of course, but uh, they represent different things that people are uh, reclaiming. And so um, that figure itself holding that sign is sort of breaking out of this uh, brick wall. So that can be interpreted to be a lot of different things, institutions, um, could be narratives, could be whatever. Leave it up to the observer, right? That's what it's for. But that's why I wanted to include this piece on here because um, I think there's a lot can be derived there. But I put those uh, beads up there, those uh, glass trade beads, because they're um, that speaks to again what we talked about today, the, the trade beads of the glass and and how important that was. And one of the things we didn't talk about is how important it was in the negotiations of our peoples. Mm -hmm. The introduction of glass beads was a huge influencer to a lot of uh, life-changing, uh, history-directing um, uh, changes because uh, our people uh, wanted these beads so badly, they appreciated the beads, you know? And, um, and so over these hours and days of negotiations with our nations, these beads would be brought in. And then of course, not to mention, uh, and for these uh, negotiations for things, uh, big big things maybe sometimes treaties and stuff like that and he and then um of course trade just general trade and so there's huge influence of our people there so that's part of this conversation too that's why i specifically put those ones because the red and the blues are the two colors that our people associate most with uh medicine hmm. and so uh th that's why those two colors in particular really were as far as trade beads go were so uh evident and mostly the most traded item colors are people during that time. So there's a lot there, like, and that's what I'm saying. Is when you look at, when you hear Sam talk, when you hear Grant talk about the research he's done and the stuff he knows about Tuscarora and Sam and Mary, and they, 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 they understand these things. Um, and that's what it's important to do is to reach out to these community peoples because believe it, contrary to a lot of uh, belief, our, our, our communities actually know a thing or two about our own communities. <laughs> yes, you do. So, well, and you know, no, I think that you bring up a really, uh, a really good point that actually I, from the parts I was actually not cut off from technologically from, I heard you mention, which was, you know, these things benefit from being kind of shared along with the voices and along with the other objects, other objects made by contemporary artists today. Because your tradition, you know, a lot of the things that you're working on are are both, right? I mean, this is clearly your voice, um, you know, being put into the a space where I can see it, you can see it, that all of our, you know, participants today can see it, and it sparks a conversation that museums should be, you know, the prime place for having those. You know, we should be a community space where these kinds of dialogues happen and and where voices are heard and they become a part of the conversation, not just a, someone else's story that's told. Um, uh, this was so helpful. Um, I, I do regret, uh, can, can we go back to the full panel? My drivers are helping me out here. <laughs> there we are. Uh, I, I regret that I haven't gotten to hear all of the, the talk today, but trust me, I will. Um, and so will everybody else here that had their uh, internet go out on them. But I'm so glad your internet didn't go out um, and that you were actually able to carry on with the, with the a program, which is going to be helpful to us. And I'm sure a lot of other people who are kind of working out through their, their way through the same, same issues. And for me, you know, one of the real benefits of the last year 
has been meeting all of you. And it started with someone who's not even here who helped with another vignette. And, you know, it's like with every other project that involves the community, the more actual relationship you have with the community, it all gets better. You know, the work, everybody's work gets better when there's relationship involved. So I really appreciate your willingness to be a part of that today. And I look forward to your voices being a part of, you know, where we are and what we do in the years to come as well. So thanks for your insights and your expertise. Uh, I'm, I do want to just check in with the chat because I'm seeing a few things down there. Uh, excellent panel. Thank you. And then beautiful work. And it was so wonderful to hear about the history and symbolism. And uh, Gwen from the New York Museum, um, which is in Albany, by the way, and also has a really wonderful collection of contemporary beadwork. Uh, so head over there if you haven't been. Um, so yeah, I, I, like, like me, I think they appreciate your presence as well. Okay, um, well, we are at time, a little over, but I did want to um, let people know that your registration for seminar also allows you to watch uh, uh, two movies that will be debuting, one at seven o'clock tonight, which is called Flame, and it's the history of frame, uh, flame working, uh, and that you just basically log on the way you logged on to get here to see that. The other one is at 9.15 in the morning. Uh, we start at nine in the morning. Uh, the the 9.15 film is The Glass of Tutankhamen's Tomb. Uh, so uh, both of those uh, will be available uh, free of cost to watch during seminar, and then after seminar, uh, they will, there will be a feed uh, required to watch them. So it's a nice kind of benefit of being uh, with us today. Uh, so if you have time and you can join in on those, I'm sure we'd love to have you. So any last words before we say goodbye, crew? I have one. It was one a pleasure. Joke. It was a pleasure. <laughs> Sam, I think it was Chris's is tonight. <laughs> I'm in Toronto. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. <laughs> yes, and thank you all for taking time from wherever you are, you in Toronto and, and Hayden, you in Oklahoma. Uh, Mary's teaching right now. <laughs> no, I, had I, a I don't know where you are. Yeah. <laughs> Once a teacher, always a teacher, right, Mary? Right. <laughs> uh -huh. So anyway, I do appreciate uh, all of your, your contributions, and I look forward to seeing you as soon as I can. So thank you all. Thank yep. you. All right. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. All right.